Amen. Amen. I want you to think about the rapture for a minute. Just a minute. Think about the rapture. First, do you believe it is true? It has happened before and it will happen again. That is the, the yardstick to measure the righteous in their own generation. In their own dispensation. It will be the same that God will use in our own generation to show those that he has accepted the rapture. After the rapture, think about the great tribulation. When the Antichrist will discover you to be one of those that know the mystery of his reign, and because you know it, you will not bow before him. What is going to happen to you? You have to make a choice. Paul says, say, I mean, Peter, save yourself from this crooked and untoward generation. Yes, Jesus has died for our sin. But we are challenged now to choose for ourselves which God we are going to serve. The true God or the God of this world. Think about the rapture. If the rapture eventually takes place, are you positive you will be one of them? If you don't have that assurance, blessed assurance in your soul, the living has hope. The living have hope. The dead have no hope. You can start walking towards it now. So that if there ever going to be a rapture it will be because of you you will be in that number saved from sin the song says I am in that number yes I am in that number saved by grace may we all have that assurance in our soul that if the rapture ever happens it will be because of you and I. None will be left behind. Amen. You may be seated. Thank God for the rain. Give the Lord a clap offering for the rain. Yes. Hallelujah. His thought for us is a thought of good, not of evil. The rain just came to cool the weather for us. Praise the name of the Lord. We will do better with a, a cool weather than a hot one. Amen. Tonight I want to share something with you. Before we go to prayers. When the weather is hot, some people will be sleeping in church. When the weather is cold, some other people will be sleeping in church. So which weather will be the best? Let us honor the word of God as we read from the book of Amos. Prophet Amos. Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, you see Amos. Hosea, Joel, after Daniel, 
Hosea, Joel, then you see Amos. Amos chapters 9. We are reading from verse 1 to 5, I believe. Amos chapter 9 from verse 1. I saw the Lord standing upon the altar. And he said, Smite the capitals or the lintel of the door and the posts may shake and cut them in the head, all of them, and I will slay the last of them with the sword. He that fleeth of them shall not flee away. And he that escapeth of them shall not be delivered. Though they dig into hell, there shall my hand take them. Mm. Though they climb up to heaven, from there will I bring them down. And though they hide themselves in the top of camel, I will search and take them out from there. And though they be hidden, from my sight hmm. in the bottom of the sea there will I command the serpent and he shall bite them and though they go into captivity before their enemies there will I command the sword and he shall slay them. And I will set my eyes upon them for evil and not for good. And the Lord God of hosts is he who toucheth the land and it shall melt. And all that dwell in it shall mourn. And it shall Rise up, holy, like, like a flood. A flood going on around the world. I want to read that again. And the Lord God of hosts, verse 5, is he who toucheth the land, and it shall melt. And all that dwell in it shall mourn. And it shall rise up holy like a flood, and shall be drowned, as by the river or flood of Egypt. May the Lord bless the reading of His holy word. Please be seated. Blessed be the name of our God. My third topic this evening is simply God at the altar. When God comes to church, where does He stand? Does that mean something to you? Amen? When the Lord is in His holy temple, where does He stand? The altar. The altar. There's a reason for that. Amos the prophet says, verse 9, uh, chapter 9 and verse 1, I saw the Lord standing upon the altar. Glory be to our God. 
the place of God in his church when his people gather to worship him is always at the altar always at the altar the altar signifies a place of mercy and a place of judgment Can you leave your books and listen to me? Let the ministers write, not you. You listen. The altar signifies a special place in the tabernacle or in the synagogue or in the temple, whichever one you call it. The altar is the place of authority, the place of power. Glory be to our God. The altar is the place from where mercy is given or judgment is given to the people of God. So let us always be very attentive to what comes out of the pulpit. What comes out of the altar. It is on the altar that sacrifices are made to God Almighty. He he receives or rejects. When he rejects, there's judgment upon God's people. If God receives, then mercy is upon God's people. Glory be to our God. Reverence and obedience in the house of God or in the lives of God's people brings mercy from the altar. Carelessness like the two sons of Aaron. Carelessness, disobedience, brings judgment from the altar. We remember Moses was commanded by God to take all the rods of all the elders of Israel who were competing with Moses, challenging Aaron to bring their rods into the temple and place them at the altar there. And the next day, God commanded him to come pick them out. And from the same altar, one rod representing the house of Aaron, the rod of Levi, came alive. Is that true? And the rest of them came out as dead as they went. That symbolizes God's people coming before God to worship Him. Some come in dead and they go home alive. Some come in dead and they go back dead. The rods of those elders represented those elders. Your worship, your offering, your tithe, your songs of praise, your prayer, everything you present before God in totality represents you. Why did the rods of the elders not blossom like the rods of Levi? Because they had a wrong conscience. Their heart was not right. Their garments may be cleaner than that of Aaron, their rods may be better than that of Aaron. But God sees beyond garments and rods. God says, I am God. I don't look on faces as men see. I look on the heart. Who did he tell that? Samuel sent to the house of Jesse. God looks in the heart. God looks in your heart when you come to worship. God looks in your heart when you bring your offering if that is the best you can give God looks into your heart when you bring your altar I mean your tithe to the altar expecting the windows of heaven to open for you to receive blessings God watches your heart when you lift up your hands to pray God watches whether they are holy hands like Paul said I wish that men will pray everywhere lifting up holy hands unto the Lord God watches the heart. 
Amos said, I saw the Lord standing on the altar. The altar has significances. And we must understand these things. The altar is a place of mercy or a place of judgment. It signifies also a high place. It types, it types a high place from which nobody can hide. Amen? You see where I'm standing? I can't see anybody. I can see everybody. Is that true? I can see people at the back, people over there, because I'm standing on a higher ground. Our God lives in the highest heaven. From where nothing can hide. Scientists that travel to the moon, they said when they took off a certain height, the whole world became like a small football. They can look down and see the ends of the whole world. Now that's just a man in a rocket. What about God Almighty? So, the altar signifies also a high place from where our God can see and from where no one can hide. I saw the Lord stand on the altar. And what was He doing there? Glory be to our God. Look at verse 9 again. I mean, verse, chapters 9, verse 1. And I saw the Lord standing upon the altar, and he said, Smite the what? The lintel of the door and the post, that the post may shake, and cut them in the head, all of them, and I will slay the last of them with the sword. He that fleeth. Of them shall not flee away. And he that escapeth of them shall not be delivered. Praise the name of the Lord. If such a prophecy comes from God in the house of God, coming from the altar of God, then the nation is in trouble. And the church types a nation. Amen. So here... God pronounces destruction with anger from the altar. God commands not salvation, not mercy, not grace, but destruction. And who and who were involved? God's people. And who was bringing the message? God's prophet. Why would such a terrible Destruction be commanded by God. It's a terrible situation, isn't it? He says, first of all, the door of the temple, the lintels, should be smitten so that they begin to shake. If the building begin to shake, the people inside it know their lives are in danger. And then they will try to escape, all right. And God says, any one of them that tries to run, will never run away. Any of them that try to escape, where will they escape to? That's natural. In the house of God, we offend God. And God brings down judgment. Rather than the whole church wail and cry and repent and confess and turn away, we want to run. We want to escape. How far can you run to escape from God? Let's turn it spiritual. God on his altar. And he sees things that is not supposed to be in his church. And he sends his messengers to declare it, to expose it, to condemn it. And the church begins to shake under the power of the Holy Spirit. People are crying, people are repenting, people are, are, are calling upon the name of the Lord for mercy. Others have in their hearts to backslide. 
I won't come to church again. Like these people here, God saw that they were going to flee because of what is happening. And God says, those of them that want to flee, they will not flee away. Those of them that want to run, they will not escape. I will catch them. You know, sometimes somebody tells me, brother son, so doesn't come to church anymore. You know what I do? I pity him. You run away from the house of God. You run away from the truth of God. You backslide because the word of God condemns you. Rather than take correction, you backslide. When you backslide, are you going to escape judgment? We should run to the house of God. Not running away from the house of God. The Bible says if we stand, let us stand in the Lord. If we fall, let us fall in the Lord. If we live, we live in the Lord. We die, we die in the Lord. No amount of rebuke, no amount of terrorization that the word of God will terrorize us. And we think the best thing to do is don't hear it again. Run away, escape, backslide. Go join other churches where the word of God is not very fierce. God only said, smite the lintel. Smite the dog. Let it begin to shake. And when it began to shake, some people's mind were made up to run. They won't want to wait to see what, is, what has caused this door shaking. And God began to say the things He will do to those who do not know the significance of the altar, the significance of the house of God. I preached a message on that some time ago. The house of God is a different house from any other building you can ever see. The house of God is a different place. The house of God is the road to heaven. What did Jacob call it? He says, God is in this place. And I knew it not. He said, this is the gate of heaven. The house of God is what? The gate of heaven. Unless your eyes are open, you won't see. I am sure. On the day that Amos saw God standing on the altar, the congregation did not see him. Because they don't have the same type of eyes. And when he began to prophesy these things, rather than repent, rather than call upon the name of the Lord in the days of trouble, the, some decided to run, others decided to escape. And God says, well, those of them that want to run, let them run. They will never escape. So, backsliders, those of you that think to worship God has become a burden to you. And you are thinking like those people from Egypt that wanted to make a captain to go back uh, to Egypt. And you want to escape. See what the Lord says. That his children in his house should recognize the importance of the house of God and the place of God in the tabernacle. God stands in his altar. God, through his servants, brings us the word. When the word of God comes and is hard, rejoice in it. If the word of God comes and condemns you, rejoice in it. Sometimes I preach against myself. God knows that is true. What I'm saying condemns me. But I say it anyway. And when next I listen to the tape, I wonder when I said it. I don't wonder at myself, when did I say all these things? The servant of God is a servant of God. God alone is God. So when the word of God comes, it's a two-edged sword. The preacher and the listener, they are on one side. The God that sent his word is on one side. So we are on the same side. Amen. Amen. All of us here, minister or no minister, we are on the same side. Saved by grace. Blessed be his holy name. 
And God began to let us know that there is no hiding place. Those that will want to hide under the sea. He says I will command serpents. And will bite them under the sea. And they will come out or die there. Then those that are that climb up to the top of camel. I will search and take them out from there. And though they be hidden from my sight, the bottom of the sea, I will command the serpents, and he shall bite them. And though they go into captivity, spiritually, what does it mean? Go back to denomination. Huh? And go back to bondage. There are many, uh, because this brother said this, that sister said that. I don't like what that minister preached. They go back to denomination. That's fine. See whether that will save you. And though they go into captivity before their enemies, there will I command the sword, and it shall also it will slay them. And I will set my eyes upon them for evil and not for good. When God visits us with a rebuke, all we need to do is take correction. Take correction. Don't start going back to denomination. Some people serve God fervently when they are nobodies. When they become somebody. When they become rich and they become big in the world, they think that message churches are too uh, out of this world for them. Then they prefer to join denominational churches. They prefer to join Pentecostal churches. They prefer to join where there are big men, governors, uh, commissioners. You know, come to church. But. Um, they forget what the scripture said. That the church of God is not made up of big, big men. Huh? He says some of you are nothing. Very few of you are rich. That's the way God calls us. Takes us from nothing and make us something. Something that we read in verse, uh, in verse 5. Speaking about the flood. What is going on in the world today? If you have been following international news, you will see all over the world how flood is devastating different nations. First, there was this terrible flood in one city in America. Uh, I forgot the name now. Katrina or something. They called the storm Katrina. But the city that it devastated in America, the first one, New Orleans. Yes, New Orleans. New Orleans is the headquarter of homosexualism in the whole world. New Orleans is the headquarters of lesbianism in the whole world. It was in New Orleans in America that people openly challenged the government that they have a right for men to marry men and women to marry women. It is not government business. And politicians agreed and approved it for them. Just for them to win vote. But God did not agree. The Bible says it is God that touches the land. Huh? And it will swell like a flood. And flood will take over the nation. It is going on from New Orleans to another place, to another place like never before. All over the world, even in our country. Some places that have never been flooded since the world began have flooded a couple of times. It's going on all over the world today. Korea and the rest of them. Japan. Industrialized nations. Where they have forgotten God. And worshipping science and technology. Busy producing GSM 
producing computers, going to the moon and going to the uh, whatever. And they have put God completely out of the program. But once in a while, God will touch the land. Because it belongs to Him. Amen? Amen? Amen. And when He touches the land, something happens. And the physician is helpless. The scientist is helpless. The astrologer is helpless. Yeah? Soldiers are helpless. Their armors are helpless. Why? God has visited the land. We are in the time of the end. Our scriptures are fulfilling daily with tremendous speed. There were some magazines I gave out, was it yesterday or the day before? Amen? Good. Those of you who have not gotten those magazines, please. I want you to get some. Not just one. Get some. For yourself. Give it to those you love. Use it for the work of an evangelist. Evangelize with it. Read it yourself first. Because it will prepare you. It was compiled by end time believing message uh, churches. It will help you. And you begin to follow what is going on in this world we are living in today. In the religious world, turn to the book of uh, Revelations, chapters 18. Chapters 18. We are going to read from verse 9 to verse 19. Revelation chapters, uh, chapters 18. We are going to read from verse 9 to verse 19. Brother, come, come read that for me, please. Read it slowly so that we can follow. Verse 19. 9 to 19. Uh, verse, verse 9, I mean. And the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and live deliciously with her shall be will, shall will her and lament for her when they shall see the smoke of her burning, standing afar off for the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that the great city Babylon, that, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. And the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her. For no man buys their merchandise anymore. The merchandise of gold and silver, precious stones and of pears and fine linen, and purple and sick and scarlet, and all dain, all dain wood, and all manner of vessels of ivory, and all manner of vessels of most precious wood, and of brass, and of iron, and marble, and cinnamon, and odor and ornament, and frankincense, and wine, and oil, and fine flour, and wheat, and beasts, and sheep and horses and chariots and slaves and souls of men and the fruits that thy soul lost it after are departed from thee and all things which were dated and god goodly are departed from thee and thou shalt find them no more at all and the merchants of these things which were made rich by her shall stand afar off for the fear of her, for the fear of her torment, weeping and wailing and saying, Alas, alas, that great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pears. For in one hour so great riches is come to naught. And every shipmaster and all the company in ship and sailors. And as many as strayed by sea stood afar off, and cried 
when they saw our smoke of our burning, saying, What city is like unto this great city? And they cast dust on her head. I cried, weeping and wailing, saying, Alas, alas, that great city wherein we are made rich, all that had sheep in the sea by reason of our, of our coast lines. For in one hour she is made desolate. Amen. 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 In one hour she is made desolate. The judgment of God, the judgment of God is so fearsome that in one hour what man has built over decades can be swallowed by nature and it will be no more. This scripture began by saying, And the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and lived luxuriously with her shall bewail her. Who is this her? We all know. Those of us who know, we know. This is the mother halot. The mother halot. The first man organized church in the world. It has nothing to do with Christ. It has no program to produce people matured to go to heaven. He has no program taking anybody to heaven. When people see this church, they, they, they reverence this church with such reverence and recognition. Every ruler, every king in the whole world, presidents, prime ministers, they must go to her and get her so-called blessing. They go and kiss her toe. Go and kiss her ring. Amen? Amen. You know who this her is? Huh? This her is a church. It's a church that controls all the political kingdoms of this world. Praise the name of the Lord. This church, please listen. This church, in the face of it, looks like a church. Because every church is a woman, right? We too, we are a woman. We are the wife of Christ. Every church is a woman. This particular church here is recognized by the rulers of this world. She's a special woman. Out of this woman, all other worldly churches came out. That's why she is called Mother of Harlots. Because her children are also Harlots. The mother of all denominations is the first denomination. And the rest of the denomination came out of their mother. And the Bible predicts that they will go back to their mother. Amen. Amen. So this woman here, all she does in her real doctrine was fornicating with the kings of the world. And what is the fornication? Her doctrines. All her doctrines have nothing to do with preparing souls for the day of judgment. For the day of rapture. They have no such program in their program. Here, God reveals to us the genuine activity of this woman on earth. What does she engaging pure business pure what business what does the Bible say it, 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 she trades in everything she sells silver she sells gold she sells precious wood just draw one small Jesus like this with gold and make you nomine patri every say to who they say, ah, 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 they sell it for 5,000. 
because it was blessed by the bishop. Then they used wood, wood to carve some for poor people. One one thousand. Then they sell uh, chalets, chaplets, whatever. Holy water, wine, oil, couplet. Ah, but from outside you see her, you call her a church. But God who sees from within is exposing to us what that organization is engaged in. There's one more thing that they are dealing on. The souls of men. Praise God our souls are delivered. Praise God our souls are delivered. Hallelujah. The prophet told us that Paul took this message to Rome. It's in the Bible, right? And the church that was founded by Paul was founded on the principle of Jesus Christ and Him alone. But some emperors of Rome pretended to be converted. And what did they do? They married the church, the church in Rome to the cultures and traditions of Rome. They cannot do without worshipping God of war, God of love, God of this, God of that in Rome. There are all kinds of gods that they worship. Like the Indians worship cow that they should eat. Snake, monkey, monkey come into the house and pet food and go and eat. And hungry is killing them. They believe hung- monkey is a holy animal. See how beautiful Indians are. But they are the most foolish people I can ever see. They see an elephant, they bow and worship elephant. Elephant sheet, they take the sheet and wrap it. And take it home. It's a holy sheet. <laughs> see the smell of it is holy. Holy sheet. Oh my God. Let us say praise the Lord. He has delivered us from foolishness. Taking us from darkness into his marvelous light. We can look back and say praise the Lord. Paul says that the church began as a Pentecostal church. Filled with the Holy Ghost. But gradually, 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 everything about Jesus Christ was removed. Instead of praying to God through Jesus Christ, they replace it with praying through... Oh, so you know. Thank God for delivering you. Thank you, Jesus. Holy Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou. What about me? Huh? If that is prayer... It should be said this way. Huh? Blessed am I among everybody. And God is with me. Is that not true? Is God not with you? Are you not blessed? That is not even prayer. God never taught us to bless Mary. Never. It was never a prayer. It was just a salutation. And because these people, this church, this her, we are talking about, she is not planning to present anybody perfect before God. It's only a business center. Brother Branham said they started Pentecostally. But gradually, gradually, they removed prayer through Jesus Christ. They removed Jesus as the head of the church. And they put a man called Pope. They removed this one, they removed this one, they removed this one. They removed, change everything, change everything. Until it is all, it became Roman Catholic Church. Which Roman man died on the cross? How can the Roman have a church? Before you can have a church, you die and, and shed your blood. Then you can be head of a church. There's only one foundation that can be laid. Which has been laid? Even Jesus Christ. Any man building should know what he's building. I want to build a solid structure. 
that the wind and the wave cannot pull down. Blessed be his holy name. How does that affect us today? Our local assemblies, our different churches, we have all started Pentecostally. When I mean Pentecostally, I don't mean the same board. I don't mean the same board. There are some churches, they are called Redeemed Church of so and so. That redeem is all only on the signboard. Only on the signboard. Amen? Go into the building, you see women with trousers. You see women half naked. You see men with earrings. Men that jericho their hair. Where, what are they redeemed from? You see women passed up. Pregnant with trousers. And he's preaching. What are they redeemed from? The redemption is only on the signboard. That's all. I may not write signboard on the board, but I want each one of you, when you appear, redemption is written all over you. All over you. All over you. Amen. When you appear among others, Redemption is written all over you. You are different. Everybody can see that you are different. Where do you worship? Oh, at grace and truth. What? Grace and truth. We've never heard such a name. Is that a new church? No. Not a new church. How many years? 30 something years old. How come we haven't heard your name? What is, what is my name? What is our name? There's only one name that is important. Amen. 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 Given by God. Given to men. By whom which we can be saved. The name of the Lord Jesus Christ. When you appear, they see redemption written all over you. And they can see that you are delivered from wearing trousers. You are delivered from Jericho. You are here every. Let our red- redemption not just be on the signboard. Let the inside of the building be better than the outside of it. Glory be to our God. The church began to degenerate. Look at where. This woman is today. It became purely a business center. Nothing, nothing they do there is designed to perfect anybody to go to heaven. People go to church with charms in their pocket. People go to church with juju. Put it on the chair of somebody they don't like. And the man will sit down there, go home in three days, he starts stealing blood. He brought it from the church. Because they trade him with the souls of men. Souls of men. How do they trade with the souls of men? Here is a, a simple, honest heart seeking God. And then the priest will say, Go and say, uh, Holy Mary, five times. And you go and do that. The next day you go back to your sin because that cannot save you. Amen? And then they sell you a cross to hang to hang at the front of your door. To save your soul, they give you a cross to hang in your house. They give you a holy water. They give you incense. These things can't save anybody. And each time they give you these things, you will pay for it. It's not free. You pay. I tell you the testimony of an old woman I used to like very much and respect. And one day I saw her wearing something. One in front here, one at the back. I said, Ah, Mama, you have a new uh, necklace. He said, No, it's not necklace. It's, they call it couple adding sock. It's an old woman. Couple had in sock. That means holy scapula, whatever. I don't know. Eh? Scapula. All right. Holy scapula. Well, the mama say couple had in sock. 
She is not an English woman. So, holy scapula. I said, Mama, what is that for? He says for prevention. To prevent her from any accident. I said, that's very nice. And Mama, who gave this to you? He says, it's the priest. I said, she, he's very kind. I hope he gave it to you free. He said, no. No. You, you buy as your money can afford. As your money can afford. He said, this one, he bought it 200 naira. Others buy as their money can afford. Then I use my brain to think. If we have old women like this, let's say one million in this country, and this one million old, ignorant, illiterate women looking for the way to heaven, somebody give them a couple of so, huh? and collect uh, 200 naira. Now, times it by one million illiterates. How much is that? Two hundred million. Now, by, by, by reverend. And whoever sold that thing together with leather. He sold it with leather. Only God knows what is inside it. Then there are some big men that will buy in a big way. Okay, now, author. Because on the day of our Lord Jesus, they were given a given offering. Some men gave in a big way. Then there was a woman that gave in a small way, but her conscience was good. And the Lord said she gave better than all the big men. Some big men will buy 5,000 own. Some big men will buy 10,000 for themselves. 9,000 for their wife. And 5,000 5, for all their children. A day in Akuko. You have to write it down that uh, a managing director of uh, Susan and So Bank bought a couple of them for 10,000 10, each. And it is announced and declared for him. Then men will take their soul and put in nonsense merchandise, making merchandise, making business. With the souls of men, souls of men and women looking for the narrow way that leads to eternal life. This woman here will give them a couple of so. And they hang it and they're very happy. They're very happy. This thing will save them from accidents. Maybe from gunshot, self. Maybe from poison. Only God knows what they told them. That they wear that in morning, afternoon, and night. Some of us. Don't even see our Bible until Sunday morning. That mama wears her couple of so morning, afternoon, night. She's very proud of it. Yet it is nonsense. What is this woman doing? She's called church. But a closer spiritual look, you find that it's not a church preparing people for heaven. It is a church making business. Business with the souls of men. And the people that get rich through that church, they get rich when they saw the destruction upon that church, upon that city. They say, wow! Only one hour. The whole city is gone? They say, which other city is like this city? As a matter of fact, none. None. Because that city rules the whole world. But in one hour, without an army, God destroyed that city. That's a warning for us. Ministers especially. Keep business out of the church. In this camp, I have personally offended many people. My dear children, Daddy, can we come and sell such and such in the camp? I say, no. You cannot. Daddy, can I bring such and such? And uh, No, you cannot. The only thing you see on display there is official. If not, it will be like other camps where half, half of the camp is marketing. Everybody selling everything. Have you seen that before? Even Pentecostal camp meetings. 
You see market everywhere. As if the I mean, there was somebody in the Bible that had to drive away market people. Amen? Right inside the house of God. It deteriorated. He, from selling, selling those rams outside and pigeons outside, it came to a point they brought it right inside the temple. Inside the temple. If you don't buy that of the high priest, then your, your ram is unclean. He has a supervisor there that will give him sign that he, he bought our own. And then he said, Not buy our own. No. The high priest will say, Well, keep it for seven days. It looks like it is unclean. And others are changing money. You bring Ghana money, they change it. You bring Nigeria money, they change it. Even Biafra money, they change it. Inside the temple. How can they pray? When the man changing money is watching his money. So the thief will not take. And then he's making sure that the change, he did not lose. How can he pray? How can anybody preach in that circumstance? They were not buying and selling in the premises. It has come into the temple. Can you imagine such a temple? Rams and goats and pigeons inside the temple. And the ministers to preach. And when Jesus came, he said, Habba, my father's house is supposed to be a house of prayer. Where everybody should be praying. Like we did yesterday. Are you ready for another one today? But some people are not praying. They are too big for that. They are selling goods. They are more interested in the money they will make. Amos said, I saw the Lord standing on the altar. And he began to say, Smack the door. Some will run. Some will try to escape. Some will try to hide. None of them will escape me. When we allow natural profit to be cloud our sense of reasoning that we brought nothing into the world and we go out with nothing. Solomon when he was wise he said there was time for everything under the sun. There is time saints for total dedication to worship God. You can never see marketing around these premises. There are many of my children who are business men and women. They come and ask me, Daddy, can we bring such and such and sell to the brethren? No. The camp is not a market square. We allow those biscuits and uh, whatever. They are because of children. Before the food is ready, the children can be hungry, they can be crying unnecessarily, the mothers can run over there, get some biscuit for the babies. Sometimes when I'm driving past, I see more big babies than bigger, bigger babies. Amen. Hunger has no respect. If not, it will not be catching ministers. Amen. But they catch us. I mean, they caught me today, seriously. Well, we must not allow that little shop there to expand to become supermarket. Huh? And then one day, some group of people will visit me. Daddy, please don't be annoyed with what we want to tell you. Yes? Um. We see the supermarket in the church at the camp. Can we put another smaller supermarket that sells something else? There's no need coming. The answer is no. It will not be bigger than what it is. Because it's not set up there for profit making. The camp manager was telling me that my little children, 400 are not registered. 400. And that they eat more than lion. 400. Their name is nowhere to be found. They are in the camp, but they are not in the camp. 400 of my little, little children. What do you concern them? They don't know what is registered or not registered. If the food is ready, they are the first to be there. 
400. Now, if the food is not ready, what will those children eat? That's why we have that little kiosk there. To provide biscuit, bread, water, drink, whatever, until food is ready. That can be understood. But when you come to this camp meeting, and your business is more important to you than the word of God, I am sorry, you have taken the first step to displease God. Because you be, all you have in your mind is the profit you are going to make. Many people come to camp for many reasons. But they don't know that God is standing on the altar. It can be at offer. It can be in Benin. It can be anywhere. Different people come to camp meeting with different reasons. If your reason is not to glorify God, to submit yourself to be washed with the water of God's word, to sharpen you, to prepare you for the sudden appearing of the Son of Man, or the Son of God, your convention is in vain. You worship in vain. This woman here, Brother Branham said, they started Pentecostally. Gradually, 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 this church here that we are reading about has become nothing but pure business organization. That's how it starts. But Abraham said businessmen should stay out of the pulpit. Is that true? Yes, businessmen that buy today, go and sell tomorrow, and buy tomorrow, and sell today, and every time they are, they are, they are thinking about money, they are thinking about the person that owes them. They are thinking about when their goods will arrive. The one they are exporting. The one they are importing. And this and that. And most of the time, time is spent purely on business uh, organization here and there. Little time to study the word. Little time to pray. Before you know it, out of the abundance of the heart, you become a businessman. More of a businessman than a minister. More of a businessman than a child of God. One day at one apostolic faith at Butemeta, an elder was invited to close the church in prayer. And the man stood up. They gave him the mic. And he said, Loruko Jesu. They say, Amen. Loruko Jesu. Then he said, Is it 1,500? Or, or 5,000 something something? Ah, everybody opened their eyes and start looking at the alaba. The man said, Oh, uh, Pastor, don't be annoyed. That he was just coming back from one appointment. All that they discussed there is what is disturbing him. Huh? <laughs> ah, the whole church tired. Alaba, give them back the mic, go and sit down. Then they call somebody to come and dismiss the church. You see, the Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the man speaks. The business, the contract, that's where his mind was. And he thought he was still praying for that business. So when he ran out, no Ruko Jesu, everybody supported him. Then all the profit he will make, he started mentioning them. He thought he was praying for the business. He didn't know he was dismissing the church. <laughs> So there's a, 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 a point a businessman will get to. Everything in his heart is business. This church has gotten to that point. That even the souls of the members of that church are being merchandised, used to make more money. Nobody's trying, trying to prepare them for the coming of the Lord. And God is on his altar. It's a warning to all of us. God gave you a ministry. He will require it. Jesus gave us a parable of uh, people that their master traveled and gave them some gifts. Uh, talents. This one five, this one three, this one one. When the master came back, he didn't forget. He called them to come and restore the talents that he gave them. Is that true? One came and said, Master, I doubled the talent you gave me. Oh, good servant. Then the then one came, I doubled the talent you gave me. Good, good servant. Then one came and said, 
Because I know the type of guy you are. So, although I'm in business, oh, but the money you gave me, I buried it inside the ground. So that when you come, I just give you as you give me. Ma- the master says, so you know. You know I'm like that. And you did not use the talent I gave you to make profit. Huh? Or I give me back. He took it from him first. And gave to the man who made the most profit. And said, tie his legs first. Ah, Oga, okay. tie his leg. I'm sorry, sir. Tie his hand also. I'm sorry, sir. Give me another chance. I'm going to tie his hand. They tie his hand. Okay. Throw him outside darkness. Now hell did that too. And he was thrown to hell. He had the opportunity. Like any other person had opportunity. But he was selfish. He didn't care about his master. He didn't know the master would return as he promised. He didn't know the master would inquire or require from him. He didn't know. He didn't think of it. So he went about doing his own business. And let the master's own business die. Even he buried it. Not that he put it in He buried it. Covered with sand. The master said, you wicked servant. Wicked servant. Why did you take it and put it in the bank? So that I will get small profit when I come back. Then let us be more engaged in our personal and private businesses. Before you know it, the devil will magnify it. And it will swallow your ministry. Because Satan is very crafty. Very crafty. And God cannot tolerate half-baked solidarity. He cannot share his glory with any man. If you are a servant of God, you are a servant of God first. Before any other thing you are. You may look for a way to feed your family. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Provided whatever it is you are doing does not supersede the ministry that God has given to you. Glory be to our God. There are one, two, three, four, five empty seats here. Or six. Or seven. I don't know where they are. These seats are not supposed to be empty. I don't know where they are. Wherever they are, I hope they can hear the word of God. Blessed be his holy name. Let's turn to the uh, scriptures again. John chapter 12. The Bible says in Revelation 18, In one hour, your ju- the judgment of this great city had come. In one hour. John chapter 12. We are reading from verse 28 to 31. 28 to 31. Can you read that for me, brother? Can you? Can you read that for me? Yes. I just don't want you to be looking at me like video. Help me. Take this one. Take this one. John chapter 12. Read from verse 28 to 31. Father, glorify thy name. Then I came back. Then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. The people therefore that stood by and heard it said that it thundered. Others said, and angel spoke to him. Jesus answered and said, This verse came not because of me, but for your sakes. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. Can we say amen? Amen. What I want to bring out there is a supernatural sign comes down from heaven. And each time there's a supernatural move of God, there are many interpretations. This one says it is this. This one says it is that. One says an angel spoke to him. One say it was thunder that roared. Everybody have his own opinion. And Jesus told them that this voice did not come because of him, but because of them. For two reasons. 
He came because the Son of Man is glorified. It came because the judgment of this world has come. And the judgment of the princes, the rulers of this world. Now we are going to take a look at some different types of judgment. 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 Judgment is a fearful thing. Anytime you are going to judgment, anytime you are going to court, it's always a fearful thing. Whether you are the complainant or the defendant, it's always a fearful situation. Because you don't know how the mind of the judge will work. We saw that in one hour, this sinful city will be destroyed. It is already revealed, it is already spoken, and it will not go back. The whole world is being flooded because God touches sinful nations and flood them up. That should not surprise you, saints. The sinful world of Noah, what happened to it? Can I hear you? Destroyed by flood. Flood is destroying many nations in our own day. The only thing that is saving the world from flood is because God has put a rainbow in the sky and said, by flood, the world will be destroyed no more. But this time, it's going to be fire. It's going to be fire. The judgment of the world has come. When did it come? The day that the Son of Man was glorified. The judgment of the rulers, the political rulers of this world, has come. When did it come? When the voice came from heaven glorifying the Son of Man. From there we see different types of judgment. The judgment of the world, we know, will be visited with divine fire, just as Sodom and Gomorrah. But before that takes place, the saints of God are given the opportunity to decide on whose side they are. Like Joshua of old, he says, my, Myself and my house, we have decided to serve the Lord. You have to choose for yourself who you want to serve. What a condemned world is your hope. Or the new heaven and the new earth that God is preparing for His people is your new hope. You walk towards that. There's another judgment. The judgment of our works. Not us, but our works. Turn again to the book of Second Corinthians Chapter 10 Are we there? Chapter 10 We are going to read From verse 1 We are going to read from verse 1 to 8. Second Corinthians chapters 10, 1 to 8. Let's start with that. Okay, brother, can you read again? 1 to 8. Now, I, Paul, myself, beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence am base among you, but be absent and bold toward you. But I beseech you that I may not be bold when I am present with that confidence. Yet I think to be bold 
against some. We think of us as if we walk according to the flesh. Although we walk in the flesh, we do not walk after the flesh. For the weapons of our welfare are not carnal, but mighty through God, who the pull it down of strongholds, cast it down imaginations, and every high thing that exert itself against the knowledge of God, and bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. And having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience, when your obedience is fully is fulfilled, do you look on things after do you look on things after the outward appearance? If any man trusts to himself that he is Christ, let him of himself think this again that as he is Christ, even so are we Christ. For though I should boast somewhat more of our authority, which the Lord has given us for edification, and not for your destruction, I should not be ashamed, that I may not seem as if I will terrify you by letters. Amen. 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 The letters Paul is talking about are the epistles that he wrote to the Corinthians. The first uh, epistle and the second one. That's what it means by letters. Here Paul admonishes the church. Paul encourages the church not to walk by outward appearance. There's a reason for this admonition. That our worship and our life will be worthy and acceptable to God. In, in chapters 5, in chapters 5, of the same Second Corinthians, chapters 5, look at verse 10. Chapters 5 and verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every man or every one may receive the things done in his body according to that he had done whether it be good or bad now Amos was saying I saw the Lord stand at the altar and he began to judge and there was no way of escape for God's own people those that run inside the water he said he would command serpent to bite them there those that climb up to Mount Camel or whatever he says he will pull them down from there. Those that are wrong, he said they will not escape. There was no way out. Why? The life of those people, though they were God's people, were more annoying and provoking to God. He got to a point, he withdrew his mercy from them, and when you reject the mercy of God, only one thing is to come next. And that is what? Judgment. And before God will come, stand on the altar and give this judgment. Amos may have prophesied to these people many times. But they won't listen, they won't pay heed, they won't take it seriously. And so God comes down heavily on his people. Paul warning us, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. It's because there will be 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10. Each and every one must appear before God. In the days of Amos, they walked carnally. They walked naturally, physically. So God appears spiritually in the temple. And Amos the prophet sees him. Today, we are walking spiritually, not by sight. Amen. We are going to appear spiritually. Everyone does not escape. You can backslide from the church if you like. You will still stand before God. You may run away to another denomination. You will still stand before God. Second Corinthians 5.10 We all must 
stand before God. Everyone. So let's begin to do righteously. Let's begin to do the things that will glorify God. So that when we come to stand before Him, we will not be ashamed. Brother Branham said, Brother Branham said, I believe all that. But that won't save anybody. We are not saved by knowledge. He says, knowledge perfect up. I read the books, I have the books, I read the tapes, I enjoy them. But they only make me more humble. They make me more humble. They make me more fearful of God. They make me understand scripture better. They don't make me puff up and think I am better than any brother, better than any sister, better than any minister. No, 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 no. It makes me more humble. If there's any sinner among God's people, that sinner is me. I see every other person as holy and righteous. I see myself desirous of more grace. More grace. More grace. What did Paul say he was? The chiefest of all sinners. And that place he says, I forget everything that's behind me. What are those things? The great miracles that God did through him. If he continues to emphasize on that, he won't win souls. Pride will take him over. So he forgets all the things that are behind. And do what? Press forward for the higher calling of God. He said, brethren, I have not yet comprehended. But there's one thing I'm sure I'm doing. I am pressing forward to that higher calling of Christ. That I may apprehend that for which I am apprehended. Blessed be his holy name. I bring my body under subjection. So that after preaching to others, I myself will not be rejected or cast away. If all of us can have that in mind. Love one another sincerely. Because that's the scripture. He says, love the brotherhood sincerely, not hypocritically. Because God is standing on his altar and no one is hidden in his sight. Whatever you have come to the camp for, he knows. If you are here to be a better child of God, he will make you a better child of God. Because you get what you ask for. Seek and you shall find. Don't come just looking for miracles. Miracles follow us. Come to see. Measure your maturity. Whether you have grown better this year than last year. How many people have you forgiven this year? How many have you helped? How many have you made sure they came to church, even if they didn't feel like coming, you will make sure they come. How many souls have you saved? How many people have you brought to the kingdom of God and they are baptized in the name of Jesus Christ? That credit goes to your spiritual account. These are the things we should be thinking about. Because we will come before God to receive, to receive what we have done in this body. Not the things we, are, we did when we were not in Christ. Those things can only be rewarded by a, a, a everlasting punishment. But when we become God's children, born into the family of God, all that we have done has a reward. Our God is a rewarder of they that diligently seek Him. We all, everyone, it will be a judgment of God's children to stand before God one by one. And when you come before God that day, would you like to hear, depart from me, worker of iniquity? Would you like to hear that? And if you don't depart quickly, then he will tell the angel to hold you there while they put the video that will show all your works. You will start begging to be allowed to go. 
you have seen enough. Hilda Brand, my friend in Canada, he said, Brother Ogu, on the day of judgment, when judgment is going on, some people will just arrive and they call the angel, the secretary of the judgment. Which way leads to hell? The secretary will say, You will pass and go back and turn this side. There's a way you ask him. He said, There's no need wasting God's time. They know eventually that's where they are going. So they want to go straight away. Criminals will not end here, it will continue and end up in hell. I read the story of a criminal that was charged to court. And the judge was asking the lawyers, uh, the man should say whether he's guilty or not guilty. The man not say anything. The lawyer whispered to the man and told the judge, the man has not answered anything. He says, well, he has to say whether he's guilty or not guilty before they can proceed with the case. The criminal stood up and said, my lord, say what you want to say. It's getting to time for them to serve food in prison. You don't want to miss the afternoon food. Any need to judge again? Natural things teach spirituality. The man stood up where he was sitting and said, Whatever they want to judge, they should judge quickly. He's getting for time for food in prison. He doesn't want to miss the afternoon food. The judge sentenced him, uh, whether uh, two years imprisonment, uh, six months. The man not even listen. In that bar, the man get up, so where the motor to take him to prison? He doesn't want to miss the food. Because there he's not going to pay house rent, he's not going to pay for food, he won't pay for electric bill, and winter is coming. See? He won't have to pay for firewood to heat for fire. So we don't want to waste his time, we want to join them and get, get the afternoon food. So will it be on the day of judgment? When God calls Brother Agubia Day and he stands there, and the God commands the angel to give him this and give him that and give him that because he did this, he did that, and you're waiting for your name. They call Brother Samson, uh, they give him that, they give him that because of what he did in the body. You're waiting for your name. They call oh, till the last person. You are still standing. God, get up. The angels carry the chair, they leave you there, come out. You are not going to hello, but you will get nothing. And don't forget, He wants to prepare us a place. In my Father's house are many mansions. Mansion, oh. Amen. Then I come to visit you in the mansion. Bed, you no get. Chair, you no get. Bucket, you no get. Only you sit for one corner, alone. Rejected and despised. Because you received nothing. You don't deserve nothing. Because in the body you did nothing. You just come to church and sit down. Time for offering, you try. Look inside your pocket. Look. Push down the 500 naira. What they bring up in here? Push them down. Then see the other red one, the 10 naira. You bring them out, roll them very well. Nobody sees it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Then, all that they put, you put, you dance back. Mm. And on that day over there, those who worked, who did, who labored, who sacrificed, are given their trophies. You stand there, they wait. Your name, no, even there for book. All those angels will look you one wicked eye. You know, those angels don't play with men. Just leave you there. When you stay tired, you go back to your house. Go sit down. Sorry for yourself. These things will happen. May the Lord help us. Look at verse 9. Chapter 5. Verse 9. Wherefore we labor... That whether present or absent, we may be accepted of Him. We labor. Why? Each one will come before God to get the reward for his labor. And if you are not laboring, you will get nothing. Nothing. 
there was an example here this afternoon I was given some CDs to my children some didn't get they look up they look down I was watching then somebody said daddy I'm not from Lagos so I'm from he said he wants to get one I'm using natural feeling the only thing that will change when we go over there is this flesh this, this body is no more there when I see this my son I will recognize him he's not going to be like a mist a smoke you know just wait no he will be majestic like he is like this my son here he will be exactly me I will be exactly the difference is this flesh will be removed and another flesh another body will be given all of us but you will still look like what you are now that's why in heaven those who know themselves recognize themselves Lazarus the rich fool they knew themselves here when they got over there did they recognize themselves? they did they did so the Bible says here we labor in verse 9 in case you are listening about in your local assemblies you are busy with business and busy with government work and busy with this and busy with that and you are not laboring for the kingdom of God God is standing on his altar and there is nowhere to hide Paul says the reason why we labor is that if we are present that is if we are alive we are acceptable to God we are pleasing to God if we are absent that means dead away from this world we are still pleasing and accept, acceptable to him so that in verse 10 when we appear to receive that which belongs to us we will not be ashamed are you laboring for the coming of, of the kingdom of God God is in his temple and God is watching there is another type of judgment found in the book of 1 Corinthians 11 that we read most of the time 1 Corinthians 11 31 and 32 1 Corinthians 11 31 and 32 for if we will judge ourselves we should not be judged but when we are judged we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world condemned with the world there is another type of judgment that is called self judgment I am to judge myself you are to judge yourself if I judge myself I will no more be judged by anybody it is people who don't judge themselves that present themselves for others to judge let me give an example if one of my daughters here who knows the truth about her being the temple of God and then she wants to go out and she dresses nice like a child of God everybody will admire her right is that true yeah. now what if my daughter knowing the truth alright then she wears a trouser and she meets you on the road with her earring like bicycle tire huh? what will you say to her if you see a sister wearing trousers, what will you say? Be honest. Don't pretend to be... What will you tell her? Huh? Now, when you say, tell her that, what are you doing? You are judging her. You are judging her because she did not judge herself. If she had looked at what she's wearing and said, No, a child of God should not dress like this. She has judged herself. Then she removed that thing and put the right thing and nobody will judge her the Bible says if we judge ourselves we will no more be 
judge. See? A, 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 a daughter of God that will abuse her husband. Abuse her husband. Disobey brazenly her husband. What is she calling for? She's calling for the elders to come and judge her. She's calling for elders to come and judge her. Because she didn't discipline herself. She didn't judge herself. So she exposes herself to be judged. A son of God that will say he's angry. Then you take his shirt and trouser and leave his house. One month, you know, see him. Two months, you know, see him. What is he exposing himself to? Judgment. Judgment. He will be judged. Because the Bible says you can be angry, all right. But it didn't say it should last for one month. Is that true? It says it should last for. Don't even let the sun go down. Because anger is a spirit, it comes and it goes. And if you resist it, it will go away. So if we, you don't judge yourself, what you should do, do it. What you should not do, do it. I mean, what you should not do, don't do it. That is self judgment. Then nobody will judge you. Nobody. Nobody will judge you. Because you judge yourself already. It is when you don't judge yourself, you expose yourself for others to judge you. And sometimes you, you are judged and you get angry. You get annoyed. You think nobody has the right to tell you what to do. Everybody has the right to tell you what to do when you do the wrong thing. If you do the wrong thing, you make yourself subject to everybody else. Those who love you will judge you. Those who hate you will judge you. People who don't even know who you are. They don't know who you are. They judge you. You say, this woman is very stupid. Look at what he did to that child. Now you sub you. You go, you don't judge you. Don't be that. Or a man gets drunk. Drink until you fall inside the gutter. Anybody person will judge him. Foolish man. You don't even know the road to his house. Come and fall down here. He doesn't know who you are. But he has judged you. Because you did not judge yourself. There's a judgment called self-judgment. It will save you from God's judgment. Take it very seriously. Judge yourself. Nobody else will judge you. And when you are judged, you are judged so that you will not be condemned with the world. That is why you are being judged. You are not being judged because people hate you. No. People who know better than you are trying to save you from yourself. There are people who hang themselves and they die. Like Judas Iscariot. If Judas had tied that rope in the market square to kill himself, do you think people will allow him to do it? No. Some sensible people will take away the rope, maybe flood him twelve lashes, but they won't let him hang. But he went into a secret place in the bush where nobody will judge him. Nobody will stop him. Nobody will correct him. Nobody will rebuke him. And he hanged himself. And that's what happens to people who will not allow others to judge them and they cannot judge themselves. What happens? They destroy themselves. God has given us privilege to judge ourselves. And we will no more be judged. Look at verse 28. To verse 30. Verse 28 to verse 30 of 1 Corinthians 11. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh judgment to himself not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. The absence of self-judgment brings destruction. Not only natural destruction, spiritual destruction also. 
Somebody don't just walk to the table or take the bread because he's hungry. They bring the supper bread. You just cut one big one, chop, because you're hungry. Then they bring the wine. You just grab the cup and drink. And thank God, say, this one will keep me until we go home. It is not served because of hunger. Is that true? No. It is served for the purpose of identifying yourself as the one for whom Christ died. If you don't know the reason for the supper, don't take it. Ask questions. Find out if you are qualified to take it. Don't just eat it carelessly. It will make you sick. It will make you weak. It can even kill you. Why? You did not discipline yourself to find out. As the deacon brings the plate, you just grab the thing, cut one big one, according to the hunger that you are feeling. Not reverently. Not because you are, that, that there is great, gratefulness in your heart that Jesus allowed himself to be killed. Allowed himself to be stabbed where the blood flew out of his body. And these things represent his broken body and his blood that was shed for our sake. You just eat it because you are hungry. It will give you the opposite of what it will give to someone who by self-judgment confesses sins accept that it is him that Jesus died for. And this bread is taking it to identify himself on earth that heaven and earth may notice him that he has accepted that he is the sinner for whom Jesus died. And drinking that blood because he is not one of those that went away when Jesus said you eat my flesh and drink my blood. You are prepared to eat anything, drink anything. Just identify yourself as one of those for whom Jesus died. Then you prayerfully drink it. Prayerfully drink it. It will give you strength for the journey. It will make you strong. Glory be to our God. Self-judgment is very important. We take one more before we pray. Romans chapters, chapters 2. Romans chapters 2. Here we are going to read what I want to describe as the divine principles of God's judgment. The principles, the rules and regulations through which God will judge the whole world. It cannot be uh, mellowed down for anybody or any nation. For all men came from one man, Adam. And through one man, sin came into the world and spread to all of us. And there's only one principle upon which God will judge humanity. And that's what we want to look at. Romans chapter 2. Brother, come and read for me again. Read from verse 1 to verse 16. I read. Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art thou judges. For wherein thou judges another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judges doest the same things. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgment that judgeth them who do such things, and doeth the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God, or despise thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance, but after the hardness and impenitent heart treasured up unto thyself round against the day of wrong 
a revelation of the rational judgment of God who will render to every man according to his deeds to them who by patience continuous in well doing seek for glory and honor and immortality eternal life but unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil of the Jew first and also of the Gentile but glory honor and peace to every man that worketh good to the Jew first and also to the Gentile for there is no respect of persons with God for as many as have seen without law shall also perish without law and as many as have seen in the law shall be judged by the law for not the hearers of the Lord are judged before God but the doers of the law shall be justified for when the Gentiles which have not the law do by nature the things contained in the law these having not the law are law unto themselves we show the work of the law written in their hearts their conscience also bearing witness and their thoughts the mean while accusing or as excusing one another in the day when God shall judge the secret of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel Hallelujah. I like that. According to my wow, not many people can say that. This is the divine principle. It cannot be altered for any man or any nation. It begins by warning us, especially we preachers, pastors, teachers, evangelists, and so forth, that stand on the altar. In the houses of God Warning men Rebuking men Encouraging men Praising those that do good Rebuking those that do bad and The Bible says While you are passing such judgments Be sure you are not doing the same yourself He says Oh man do you believe you will escape If you judge Concerning these things And you do it yourself will, Do you think you will escape These are divine principles Of God's judgment Judgment will be According to your works Like we read Each and every one will appear Before God And receive According to his works in the body In verse 5 What we just read He says but After thy Hardness and impenitent heart, you treasure up unto yourself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous indignation of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds. What a fearful scripture! Those of us who have Hard hearts The Bible says we are only Accumulating more and more anger Upon ourselves That will be exposed on the day That God will reveal His righteous indignation So there are people That what they will receive on the day When all men shall stand before God it's nothing but wrath upon wrath Indignation Of a holy God Why? Their heart was so hardened That they cannot let go They cannot let go Of worldly things And let God have his way You just cannot resolve The little problem between you and your wife Instead You can make a, a girlfriend outside You abandon your wife and your home you are piling rot and rot and anger of God upon yourself. There is no escape. 
God says those that will run away, they won't run far. He will bring them back. Those that go to the mountain, from the mountain He will bring them back. Those that will get angry of the word of God, hardness of their heart, make them go and hide under the sea. God says I will command serpents and will bite them there. There's no hiding place. There's no hiding place, saints. The only place you can hide is under the shadows of his wings. Amen. Amen. It says the hardness of your heart. Impenitent. A heart that cannot repent. You can never tell him what to do. The moment he decides to break down this house, he must break down this house. Impenitent. Hardness of heart. You think that is making you tough. No, it means you're a fool. You are not tough. God standing on his altar, watching his children worship. Hypocrisy everywhere. Then he had to send down judgment. Send down judgment. A very hard one. Now we are given the privilege to judge ourselves. Everyone, judge yourself. He says the long suffering of God is to give us chance to make things right. But instead, we respond with hardness and impenitent heart. You are pastor, preach, preach, preach. You say, I only to talk. Pastor, teach, teach, teach. Now you only to talk. What are you doing to yourself? You are healing more anger and more anger upon your life. Waiting for you on that day when the righteous indignation of God will be revealed. And every man is given according to his deed. Then you will know that your hardness of heart an impenitent heart a heart that can never change never repent you see another man's wife you want to go to hell because of her and no matter what anybody says you say I only to talk there's coming a day when God will give you the reward of what you have done in this body I hope you'll be willing and happy to receive what you are due. So saints, as we see the end of the world, God is touching many sinful nations and flood is swallowing them. Watch CNN. See what is going on. Watch Al Jazeera. See what is going on. Even our own local stations, they show you what is going on around the world. It is not done by anybody. They say uh, global warming. Global warming. Whatever they like, let them call it. The Bible says it is God that touches the land and it will overflow. It's going on around the world. Sinful nations. Nations that have forgotten God, they have developed scientifically, and they are, they are world powers, economic powers. Look at all of them. They are crumbling left, right, and center. The Bible said to be so. Nations will crumble until they will all be looking towards Rome for the Pope to rescue them. It is coming, and it's coming fast. The Antichrist stage is set. The Euro nations are at the Antichrist stage. They will eventually turn to Rome because all their money will end up useless and without, without value. And they will eventually hand over to the Pope to rescue them. And that will be the stage that the Antichrist will take. And who knows? Because we are not vessels made for wrath and punishment. We are vessels of honor. The rapture can take place before then. 
and God will take us away from here. The Antichrist will have no business with us. Blessed be the name of our God. How soon? I cannot tell. How soon? I cannot tell. But the signs of the time is showing that it is nearer now than when we first believed. Judgment. Amos said, I saw God standing on his altar. You may not see physically, but from today, I want you to know when you go to church, be conscious. God may be standing on the altar in your local assembly, speaking through his servant. You may not see him, but he's there. Either he's there to pass judgment. Or he's there to declare mercy. May his mercy be multiplied unto us all. We will stop here today and continue tomorrow. Let's stand together. Hallelujah!